This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Every fall in Monroe, North Carolina, the crowds descend and vintage warbirds and skilled hands take flight. It's still an adrenaline rush. It never gets old. Thrilling the audience. You want to see things go boom. You want to feel the heat from those explosives. This is where you want to be. It's awesome. Putting aviation history on full display. We've got 40 to 50 vintage World War II aircraft. And honoring those who defend our freedoms. It's all about getting the public to interact with the veterans. On this trail of history, meet the pilots, veterans, and airplane buffs who share their passion for keeping aviation history alive. So buckle up as we take to the skies at Warbirds over Monroe. Since the invention of power flight, folks have flocked to air shows to witness pilots and their flying machines go head to head with the law of gravity. Each November, in conjunction with Veterans Day, aviation enthusiasts from across the country converge at the Charlotte Monroe Executive Airport. The air show you see this weekend is uh, the Warbirds over Monroe air show, and it's a mainly a Warbird show. We do have some non Warbird guys that do aerobatics and things that kind of help uh, keep people interested. Um, it started back in 2005 with uh, me and Mr. Russell hanging out at the hangar and deciding that we wanted to, to do something for the veterans of Union County. It all started as a friendly fly-in and hangar dance put on by the nonprofit Warriors and Warbirds. A humble beginning that took flight as the Warbirds over Monroe Air Show, hosted by the city of Monroe. We actually became a full-fledged air show about 10 years ago. That first year, you know, five or 10,000 people, and now, you know, we're looking at upwards of 50,000 people coming out here over the two days, and bigger, better, more planes. We've got, um, we've got our flagship, the Tinkerbell. This, the city of Monroe C-46 is out here, dropping paratroopers. We've got 40 to 50 vintage World War II aircraft. We got helicopters, we got reenactors, we got food, we got kids activities. We've got uh, P-51 Mustangs. This year we've got a P-40 War Warhawk, but we also have a de Havilland Mosquito, which there's only three of them flying in the world. And if you haven't seen this plane, it is awesome. It is so cool, big plane, uh, British plane, and uh, it's just made of wood. You wouldn't even think of it by looking at it, but you, everything about it is wood. It is just very cool. You name it, we got it out here. It's all about getting the public to interact with the veterans. Um, the aircraft we have here, a lot of them are from World War II, um, and a lot of those veterans, as, as you all know, are fading away every day. Most of our planes are, are 1940s, Tinkerbell's 1944. So we might have an older gentleman sitting here sharing his story about how he was an engineer on that plane or how he flew on that plane from who knows where. And standing right next to him, you might have a little seven, eight-year-old sitting there, wow, what kind of plane is this? And just that overlap of that generation where the, the older gentleman could share with the kid. And we have our people on, on standby to kind of share information to it. It's just, that's what it's all about. The kids aren't getting taught uh, the significance of these aircraft in school because there's so much information. But if it wasn't for planes like this, planes like the Mustang and Corsair, you know, our country would look a lot different. Uh, these planes were so significant in, in World War II they really changed the, the tide of history. We've got a paratroopers, World War II team that'll jump in these round chutes. So if it's a little windy, they might kind of get blown out by the trees there because they don't have a lot of control. But it's really cool because they jump out of this plane. A show of this magnitude needs its own army, an army of volunteers. You name it, it's, it's a true uh, team effort. But we also have the group from Warriors and Warbirds. So they supply a couple hundred volunteers, everything from, you might have saw them behind me moving trash cans to uh, staging portageons to picking up this and picking up people from the airport and making sure all the planes have fuel and oil and just, just taking care of everybody. Because it's just a, a major team effort. It's a major undertaking, but it's well worth it for, for everybody around here.
at warbirds over Monroe, spectators see all types of aerobatics, warbird flybys, and historical reenactments like Tora Tora Tora. Everybody likes Tora. They do a fantastic reenactment of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Now, it gets emotional for some, but it, the narrator gives a good rendition and, and puts you in the shoes of the, of the soldiers and the people that were at Pearl Harbor during that time. It's really emotional, really educational, and it just really ties in with us trying to, to teach and educate the folks that come out to our show. We're proud that kids can come to air shows and learn about history. And it's a living history lesson. It's about, it's three parts. It's, it's our airplanes. It is the pyrotechnics. You'll see lots of pyrotechnics going on, the explosions that would be the bombs we're dropping, and then our narrator. Without any of those three, it's not a complete show. It's precision flying with intent focus. When we're in the air, I guess everybody's like me. We're busy. Uh, we all know where each other's at. We're flying lines on the ground that give us horizontal separation because when you're in the crowd, you will see us oppose each other many times. Well, it looks like chaos, but it's a very choreographed, and we do the same thing every single time we fly this show, but, but you're busy. You're watching airspeed, you're watching bank angles, you're, you're watching for where everybody's at. Uh, there's not anything going on on the radio. We don't talk on the radio when we're flying the act. So uh, you're busy and it is an adrenaline rush. Across the airfield we have pyrotechnics. So if you want to see things go boom, you want to feel the heat from those explosives, this is where you want to be. It's just an, an awesome, awesome display. For the pilots of Tora Tora Tora, it's not all about the adrenaline. One of the best things that we get out of coming to these shows is to meet veterans. We've met several Pearl Harbor survivors over the years. Not too many of them are left with us anymore. Air shows are very patriotic, and it's very exciting to be at an air show. And when you feel the concussion, and you see the fire, and you see the smoke trailing out of the airplanes, it's much easier to put yourself that there that day at Pearl Harbor. You can imagine what people were thinking. We have to remember where our freedom comes from and, and why we get to enjoy the privileges we do. The Tora 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 Team Legacy dates back more than four decades. And while based in Texas, the group's roots sprout from Hollywood. And Tora 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 belongs to the commemorative Air Force. Uh, these airplanes were built in the late 60s by 20th Century Fox to make the movie Tora 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 that came out in 1970. Now, they don't actually fly Japanese planes in the show. After World War II, most of Japan's warplanes were destroyed. So when it came time to make the movie, the studio got creative. So 20th Century Fox took North American T-6s, which is a World War II trainer, and converted them into what you see here. And, uh, and then we have one Val dive bomber with us this weekend. It was built from a Volte BT-13. Today, it's the longest running private air show team in the U.S. We have 15 pilots, 11 airplanes, and we always try and do a show with eight airplanes. There's been about 110 Tora pilots in the 45 year history. But the legacy of Tora 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 doesn't stop with the show or its Hollywood history. For a few members of the team, like pilot Patrick Hutchins, it's about family. My father flew this airplane for 35 years I was 16 years old when I started watching him fly Tora, and so I always knew I would eventually do it. And as of the 2017 season. This weekend I think I'll hit my 250th performance over pyro, and it's still an adrenaline rush. It never gets old, and no two are ever the same. China is now our fighting ally or more accurately, we are China. But China has been fighting our enemy, Japan, for seven long years. During World War II, the Chinese were our allies against the Japanese. 
In order to get supplies to them, cargo planes had to fly a route called the Hump. From fields in India, an Air Transport Command plane takes off every six minutes, loaded with artillery, jeeps, ammunition. So this plane, again, it's a C-46 Commando, built in 1944. It's a Curtis Wright aircraft. At the time, it was the largest twin-engine plane uh, in World War II. It's got about 110 feet from wingtip to wingtip, wider and bigger than a B-17. And it was used primarily in the, the CBI campaign, in the China-Burma-India campaign, to fly from China over the Himalaya mountains to Burma and India to get supplies to our troops that were landlocked, to get our wounded and get our sick out of there. Uh, so the camel's paint on the side of the C-46 or, or any aircraft that operated in that theater um, was basically if you flew a full load of crew as far as uh, soldiers or a full load of cargo at your maximum weight and made it over the hump, they'd paint a camel on the side of your planes. C-46, interesting history, it's actually a very old design. It was designed back in the uh, late 30s to be the first pressurized commercial airliner. Originally, the nonprofit Warriors and Warbirds brought this particular C-46, named Tinkerbell, to Monroe as a flying museum. Today, their dedicated team of volunteers keep Tinkerbell in the sky. But the city of Monroe saw a unique opportunity and bought the old Warbird from the group. So we bought it as a way to, one, promote our air show, but two, promote our aerospace industry. We have some of the highest concentration of aerospace industry in the southeast, right here in Monroe. There's no city that owns a vintage World War II plane that takes it to air shows and, and, and is that dedicated to the preservation of history. It is a lot to maintain. It, it's like a, an old, 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 rare car. You can't find parts for it. Uh, you have to make a lot of the own parts and the parts you can find, they're very expensive. So. We do what we can, we keep it flying. It's an amazing piece of history when you're in there and realize that that plane was built in uh, Buffalo, New York by a bunch of the Rosie the Riveters. Um, and she's still in great flying condition and uh, yeah, we love taking it to air shows across the country. American industry produced over a quarter of a million aircraft over the course of World War II. But many of the planes that survived the battle didn't survive America's post-war appetite for steel and aluminum. Planes were scrapped by the thousands, but one organization made it its mission to save the old warbirds. We're with the Commemorative Air Force. It's a not-for-profit organization that has squadrons nationwide. It's existed for over 50 years, and its goal is to take these old World War II airplanes and uh, keep them flying. Flying to air shows, giving crowds a chance to get up close with each plane. These airplanes in particular, they're a piece of history that, that essentially cannot be replaced. Uh, we fly them around, uh, let, let kids and, and people come in and look at them and sit in them and experience what it would have been like to be a, a 22 year old pilot flying over the, the jungle treetops in, uh, in Asia, uh, doing reconnaissance and looking for downed pilots. and danger of that and what, what those people did, uh, did during the war. Yeah, so this is a Stinson L5, L stands for liaison. It was uh, purpose built as a reconnaissance aircraft for World War II. This was uh, kind, of, kind of known as the, uh, the Jeep of the airplanes. Uh, General Patton was ferried around Europe in a plane like this. Again, there's a version that uh, is an ambulance version, and then it did uh, an incredible amount of spotting and liaison. Uh, and, and reconnaissance uh, uh, activities as well. So it was really, um, really a very versatile, air, versatile airplane. It was not armed. This airplane is a, uh, a TBM Avenger. It was a carrier-based uh, torpedo bomber. This is World War II as well. Uh, again, carrier-based, has a gross takeoff weight of about 18,000 pounds, uh, has an 1,800 horsepower motor on it. This is actually the type of airplane that uh, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, Bush 1, flew in World War II that he was shot down in. Has a crew of uh, four, uh, including turret, uh, uh, ball turret, rear turret, radio operator, navigator, and then pilot. This makes, makes us feel good to see a guy come up and, and, uh, and say, you know, I was 17 years old when I, when I flew this off to war. And uh, of course, obviously, we let, him, we let him get in and sit in it. 
Um, we want to hear their stories that we can pass those stories on as well. But it's, uh, it's a very, very good positive feeling for us that we can bring these things to these air shows and, um, and let people, people who obviously were veterans in them, come up and see them and experience them. And then also, as I was saying before, having the younger generation come out and look at them and get inspired and want to get involved in, in aviation in the commemorative Air Force. Well, following the end of World War II, during the rebuilding phase of Germany, the Russians wanted to force the United States, Great Britain, and France out of Berlin. And so they had a massive blockade, uh, trapping 2.5 million people in the capital. And uh, with the idea of Great Britain, this massive airlift was started to uh, sustain 2.5 million people. Big, big operation, never been tried before became known as the Berlin Airlift. Anything and everything, two and a half million people would need to survive is what they flew in. The result was uh, we'd been friends with Germany ever since. This was a tough operation. They were our enemy just a few years earlier in World War II. Uh, so this, this, this caring enough to, to help these people is what the airlift was all about. Um, but as a result, uh, the Russians lifted the blockade. Today, the Berlin Airlift Historical Foundation flies this aircraft to shows around the country. This airplane was used by the U.S. Navy during the Berlin Airlift. This is a very rare Douglas C-54, and what we represent is the 330 C-54s that were used in the Great Berlin Airlift of 1948-1949. What we do is on the inside of this magnificent airplane is a museum exhibit about that operation where the first time in history an airplane was used for humanitarian purposes. It looks city of the ramp just like an old cargo airplane, but when they get inside and see the displays, it's, it's fun to watch their reaction. It shows what, can, what the end result can be when people start to work together for something good. Probably the biggest lesson learned in the airlift, here's a former enemy and we went in there and helped sustain two and a half million people. And they never forgot that. That was really a, quite an operation. Uh, we take great satisfaction in keeping the airplane airworthy and showing this type of history where one of, the, one of our country's finest hour was what they did during the Berlin Airlift. Airplanes aren't the only type of flying machines on display at Warbirds over Monroe. Meet Army veteran and Cobra pilot Jeff Moss. I'm with the Army Aviation Heritage Foundation and Flying Museum Sky Soldiers Demonstration Team. Army Aviation Heritage Foundation, we started in 1997, so we've been around quite a long time. It's an organization of veterans and essentially our mission is to keep our aircraft flying. So a lot of times you see warbirds on sticks or at museums, static displays in front of a, an American Legion or a VFW. We actually take our aircraft to the public, and believe it or not, we're able to take the public for rides in these warbirds. The foundation gives people the chance to fly in Vietnam-era helicopters, such as the iconic Huey and the Cobra. Two distinctly different aircraft. The Cobra was America's first dedicated attack helicopter, and naturally the Huey served a number of roles, from inserting troops into to combat, to carrying uh, bullets and supplies, food, you know. That those, those mission of the Huey is profound. It's the icon of the Vietnam War. Everybody connects the Huey to that war, and when they hear that distinct sound, the, the blades turning and the, the wop wop of the uh, Huey, they, it immediately takes a veteran, especially a Vietnam veteran, back. When you have a veteran come out, it's not uncommon to see tears in the eyes. Emotions flowing readily as they're, you know, dealing with the, the the feelings of, of that war and, and again, not being welcome home. So on behalf of the Army Aviation Heritage Foundation and Flying Museum to all veterans, especially those from Vietnam, we're proud and happy to say welcome home. And as veterans ourselves, we're proud to be representing all of you uh, with what we do here. All of our pilots, all of our crew chiefs, everybody that volunteers with this organization has, I promise you, shed a tear at one point or another just because we realize how important this mission is and what we do is, is incredibly valuable, especially for, for disabled veterans and those that have suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. 
These are healing machines as much as they are warbirds. Uh, my name's Eric uh, Montoya, and uh, I'm from uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. He joined the U.S. Army in 2001, just before 9-11. I ended up serving uh, overseas in, in you know, Iraq, you know, um, a total of three uh, tours, and uh, well, pretty much the rest is history. Montoya suffered an injury while in the service, but it didn't keep him from sharing something special with his son, flying on a Huey. Uh, it was breathtaking and exhilarating. Uh, this is my first time, you know, my son and I, uh, you know, got to ride in a, in a H1 Huey, and it, it was just uh, an awesome experience. But uh, it was also like a, a very good, you know, father and son bonding experience at the same time. It's just, you know, something, you know, you know that you know we will never forget. And it, it kind of, you know, makes you appreciate too what these Army aviators go through to serve their country as well. You know, this is part of our history. This is part of what makes us, you know. American. Like now when we're struggling with patriotism and, and folks trying to find their way in that regard, to be able to connect with the American soldier and understand that our freedoms and liberties were derived from people actually strapping aircraft like this Cobra to their backside and going into combat to, to basically to liberate others, to bring liberty to the United States of America and to keep us safe. Pilot Bob Yanichek caught the flying bug early in life. I think most of us all start with model airplanes and things and got my license back in the early 90s and, and then I was hooked. It's passion he uses to fuel the work of the Warriors and Warbirds organization. The mission of Warriors Warbirds, uh, we originally started to help educate the, uh, the public and recognize our veterans of uh, Union County. We are actually a 501c3 aviation museum, but we also have some military vehicles. We have a 1942 Willis Jeep. We have some uniforms and things. We're in the process, it's like any museum, of expanding. Um, kind of running out of room, but uh, you know, we're, we're slowly expanding. We have an A4 Skyhawk that was used uh, during Vietnam era, Korea also, and that's a static display aircraft that uh, kids can get up and close to. Um, and then we operate the C-46 Commando um, Tinkerbell that uh, we have based right here at Monroe, and this is uh, uh, the co-founder and mine, uh, Bob Russell's uh, Focke Wolf 149 that was used uh, to train Luftwaffe right after World War II. It's hard to believe this old warbird came to America with some assembly required. That's a, a 1962 Focke Wolf 149. Um, it's what the West Germans used to train their pilots right after World War II. It's actually an Italian design, but the Germans assembled most of these in the Focke Wolf plant in Bremen, Germany. Um, it's a great aircraft. You know, Mr. Bob Russell uh, bought it sight unseen back in 1982, and after 14 years of restoration, it looks like it does today. Yanichek says it takes a special breed to tackle a restoration. I think uh, you have to have a passion for restoration, for aviation in general. Um, you know, once it gets in your blood, it's hard to get it out, and it's not the cheapest hobby or, or, or the cheapest thing to get involved in, but you know, most of us make these sacrifices just to keep these things going, so we preserve a little bit of history. Each year at the show, Warriors and Warbirds transforms its hangar from a place to park airplanes to a dance hall and a chance to experience a bit of history. It's always a World War II theme on Saturday night after the air show. We encourage people to dress up. We have a huge number of reenactors coming here and we have a big band that, that plays the music of the, uh, the air and some singers. I could say Bella, Bella, even say Those singers, the Ladies of Liberty, the group is owned and managed by Wanda Martin. Well, we sing, of course, Boogie Boogie Bugle Boy. We sing Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree by Mir Bistu Shane, which is a, a nice Yiddish tune that the Andrews sisters did. And of course, you know, we do patriotic too. About half of our uh, show is a patriotic salute so to America, the greatest nation on earth, of course, and all of our military and veterans. So wherever we go, we always end the show with somewhat of a patriotic uh, show. Martin says the Ladies of Liberty perform over 60 times a year, performances that bring a piece of the past into the present. Kind of uh, known as reenactors, because we go to a lot of things, such as this. We have people that really get into it and they dress the part. They, they kind of want to go back and feel that feeling. And so we feel that every day. Every time that we sing or play or do these songs, 
we kind of go back into that era, and it's kind of fun. I mean, playing dress up is fun, but we actually feel like we absolutely have a purpose in what we do. Yeah, it is almost like a time uh, time warp to go back and, and see everyone in the uh, the, uh, the military dress from the time period. And like I said, it's raw, doing the dances from the era also and the music, so it, it kind of blends it all together. I like to keep alive the spirit of the greatest generation. Uh, so many people forget that, and that was the basis to me. World War I was something, I'm, I'm kind of a buff, I read about all the wars, but World War II was something different. Everybody was working for the same victory. And you've never seen that since, really. It's a hectic weekend for the organizers. There's so many moving pieces. And being a city-run show, the city of Monroe pays for everything here. We make absolutely no money on this. It's, it's a quality of life thing for our residents. It's a way to give back to our veterans. It is just such a team effort and such a massive undertaking. But when you come and finally get to see everything come together, the planes come in, the, the looks on the kids' faces when they're looking up and seeing the, the crazy stuff going on up in the air, it, it just makes it all work. And thanks to air shows like Warbirds Over Monroe, the history will keep flying and memories will continue being made. Thank you for watching Trail of History. of PBS Charlotte.